Heidi. Yes. Um, hello, good afternoon. Um, this is Dr. Deborah Cohen, and I'm the Maven volunteer moderator today. And thank you all, all for joining us and our friends at La Clinica de la Raza, who are the anchor clinic for today's session on treatment um, resistant depression. I'd like to tell you a little bit about our speaker, um, Judy and Smith. Dr. Smith is a retired general psychiatrist who had a private practice in Madison, Wisconsin for over 35 years. She is an active clinical adjunct assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Wisconsin Hospital and Clinics. Until 2008, she was the medical director for a mobile community outreach treatment program through the Mental Health Center of Dane County in Wisconsin providing care for patients with severe schizophrenia. She has always loved teaching and over the years has supervised a variety of professionals in the community who are providing care to patients with a mental health diagnosis. Um, thank you, Dr. Smith. And with that, you can begin. All right, very good. Well, welcome everybody. And uh, I have nothing to disclose as far as financial investment in any of the medications I'll be talking about today. Um, and this is accredited for um, uh, continuing education units. All right. And uh, you guys, I can go over the goals, but I think that's kind of boring to do. But I just, I'll just summarize that what I want to do today is really help you guys sort out what's pseudo treatment resistance from truly treatment resistance and what you do in a methodical way to sort that out. Um, missed medical causes, all of those kind of things. Missed psychiatric diagnosis, because if you're diagnosing the wrong problem, you're not gonna treat it right and it won't respond. So we hope to go through that. And then at the end, I wanna go through what things you can do when you truly have someone who appears to be treatment resistant to the antidepressants you've tried them on. Um, when you've got these long waiting lists for psychiatrists in the community. So um, let me proceed. So basic facts real quickly, 7% of the U.S. population at any one time is struggling with depression uh, in this country. And it goes up to 10% when you add in patients with bipolar depression. And this whole percentage went sky high during COVID isolation. Um, although all antidepressants are effective in treating depression, they fail to achieve remission in one out of three patients. That's a lot of patients. And then when you look at the patients that are going to respond, you know, we know that 60 to 70 percent of patients will respond to the first antidepressant. Only about 50 percent of those that respond, however, are gonna get a full response. And guess what? A little depression is not a lot of fun. So we wanna get it lifted fully. Not only is it not a lot of fun, but also they're at increased risk of further relapse back into the severe depression, okay? If we don't lift it fully. So let's talk about the definition of treatment resistance because when you look at the different studies used um, looking at how to treat treatment-resistant depression. Um, definition of treatment-resistant varies, <laughs> and it's not very useful if you don't get a good definition, meaning the best standard is you want a, a failure of two antidepressants, and it's get these have to be trials of adequate dose of the medicine, meaning if they use a real do low dose, because the patient can't tolerate it, that's not considered treatment resistant. That was a failure of that medicine for the patient to be able to tolerate. But so you want an adequate dose of two antidepressants and you also want adequate duration. And we're gonna talk about what adequate duration is. So what is adequate duration? Eight to 12 weeks, 12 weeks ideally, okay? And when you look at studies done with antidepressant medication, they're rarely even eight weeks old. Drug companies have very different goals than we have, which is to figure out what's the best choice and, and direction to go with treatment. Their goal is to save money 
make the study as short as possible, where they get the results they want to get FDA approval. Okay, that's all. That's what they want. So really, we know from the Stardy study, which is kind of this foundation study where the drug companies didn't, weren't funding it, if the federal the government was funding at our tax dollars, large, large populations of people across the United States put on various medications. When they looked at their, when they did their study, what they found was that, okay, so two thirds of the patients that were gonna get better on an antidepressant did so by the sixth week of treatment. The other one third that was gonna get better on an antidepressant got better between weeks eight and 12. Wow. Okay, so when when medicines are stopped, even at eight weeks, you're looking at missing a third of them that are gonna respond if they were given more time, okay? So, but it's a tough dilemma because are you gonna ask your patients to wait 12 weeks with every medicine you try? So most of us do kind of a, telling patients this information, letting them know it takes time, but also um, sometimes looking for, are we getting a little bit of a response, which keeps us encouraged that we will see continued improvement with more time, okay? What's an adequate dose? So these are kind of the ranges we're looking at for what we'd consider an adequate dose. Bupropion, um, a, you know, to side effects or 450 milligrams and no response at lower doses. Then lefaxine up to 375 milligrams of no response at lower doses. But I, I do wanna draw your attention to venlafaxine because it's kind of got a quirky thing that I always want people to know. We think of venlafaxine or Effexor as an SNRI, but it's actually an SSRI until 150 milligrams then it starts affecting norepinephrine and that's going to become important later. So I'm just going to draw your attention to that, but let's keep going. Fluoxetine, 60 milligrams a day, sertraline, 200, escitalopram, 20 milligrams. Not to say I might not go, I might go above 20 milligrams with a patient, but if I don't see any response at 20 at all, at 12, you know, weeks, then I would not push that dose up further. But if they had a partial response that plateaued, plateaued, yeah, I might push that up to 25 or even 30 milligrams. Duloxetine, 90 milligrams per day, although there is some data suggesting no advantage over 60 milligrams a day, but I've certainly seen patients who needed a full 90 milligrams to get their full response. So what is pseudo-resistant depression? Pseudo-resistant depression is when a patient has had an inadequate dose or duration of treatment. So when they say, yeah, I failed two medications, I wanna know what was the dose and how long were they on that adequate dose, okay? And if they don't meet those qualifications we just went through, they haven't had a, a, a treatment failure to that medicine, okay? The other thing is, Pseudo-resistance can be non-compliance with, with treatment. And we'll talk about that in a minute. It can also be that they were given the wrong medicine because their diagnosis was wrong. Okay. And yet still they're labeled treatment resistance when they're not, okay? Now, we also wanna remember that smoking affects uh, many antidepressant blood levels, and that can also cause kind of a, um, a false picture with your patients. So there are four groups of medications that the blood level is severely affected by tobacco use. Okay? Duloxetine, tricyclic antidepressants, bupropion, your Wellbutrin, and fluvoxamine, which is Luvox. All of those may need even higher dose if they're smoking, but the patient also has to be warned that if they stop smoking, that's great, but let you know, because you're gonna need to adjust that dose. Back. Okay, here we go. Also, as we talked about, you can have non-adherence with the medication. It has to be ruled out. We know that 20 to 50% of patients 
given an antidepressant prescription, a non-adherent, okay? They toss it in the trash or they start the medicine, stop it or whatever very quickly, okay? And we clinicians are terrible at picking that up. That data is well established. Um, all of us like to feel, and I know I'm one of those people that know my patients are taking their medicine. I'm just sure. Um, and but the reality is they often aren't. And those are that data is based on getting interviews from doctors, the patients who all insist they're taking it, and then they do blood levels and find there's absolutely nothing in the patient's body. Okay. So the important thing is how do you ask about adherence? And I wanna just give you a couple tools that I use that I wanna make it as easy as possible to tell me because if I don't know they're not taking it, I can't talk to them about alternatives or whatever, okay? So a couple of ways, I wanna make it really easy because they wanna please us. They're coming to us, we have power, a power dynamic, but also they wanna please us. They wanna tell us that they didn't take our prescription. So there's a couple of things that I use. I use depression is a disease that affects energy and drive. Has this made it hard for you to get your medicine in daily? That's one thing you can make it a little easier for them to share that. Depression carries a lot of stigma in our society. Has that made it difficult to, for you to want to take this medication? Um, and also, if anyone tells me, well, I might have missed a few days here and there, I say, thank you so much for sharing that with me. I so appreciate it. I can always work with people who will tell me if they're not taking it because I, I appreciate that and we can figure out alternatives or what's getting in the way. So thank you for sharing it. And I want to praise the Dickens out of them being honest with me. Okay. Also, we want to not forget that depression is a recurrent disease. That is very important. These are the recurrence rates after the first episode of depression. So 50% are risk in the next 10 years. After the second episode of depression, 70% have a recurrence within five years. After the third episode, 90% recurrence within three years. Woo, now we're really, there's some risk to stopping the medicine. And the other thing to know about it is what we see is when someone relapses on, I mean, after going off to their medicine and we put them back on, it takes longer for a response to that medicine. And sometimes the response isn't as good. And we have to keep that in mind as we're, you know, giving it more time um, with subsequent treatments and also taking that into consideration when we're talking about the pros and cons of tapering off an antidepressant that is working. But depression seems to kindle itself. Risk factors for treatment resistant depression. So non-response to the first antidepressant makes them less likely to respond to the second. Young age of onset, many reasons possible for that. We know the immature brain, uh, preteens and teenage brains just do not respond as well to antidepressants. It's might a little bit later in life, but also are we grabbing some people with bipolar disorder, you know, in that group, et cetera, which may make it less treatment responsive. Longer duration of illness and more recurrent episodes older current age, we know the older brain is not as responsive to antidepressants. That may have to do with uh, decreased blood flow to the brain. And there's some studies going on looking at using some blood pressure medicines that may increase blood flow to the brain with antidepressants in senior citizens that might help with that, okay? And of course, more severe depression um, is also at increased risk for treatment-resistant depression. So ruling out the medical causes first in treatment-resistant depression. So when I have a patient come in and they say they didn't respond to medications, I want to make sure there's nothing missed medically. You guys are so good with this, so, but I'll just review it real quickly. Certainly, um, hypothyroidism with a TSH and T4, and now many people suggest getting a T3 with that. Hyper, hypercalcemia, uh, severe vitamin D deficiency, certainly want to look for bone pain with fatigue, 
But by the way, studies on treating depression in people with severe vitamin D deficiency by adding vitamin D have not shown good results. It may be that that's, you know, depression is kind of causal in dropping that vitamin D or making it hard to absorb vitamin D. We don't know. Certainly you may need to uh, replenish the vitamin D for other reasons, but it doesn't seem to treat the depression. So you do want to go ahead and treat depression too with antidepressants. And of course, medications causing depression. So I always look for the onset of their depression and what medicines may have been started around that time or dosage increased during that time, such as topiramate is a common one we see, and that can cause depression and it's very dose related. So if that they're on topiramate for migraines and or other things, and it was increased around that time, dropping the dose could all be all you need to do. Okay. So now we also want to rule out alternative psychiatric diagnoses that may masquerade as treatment resistant depression. And the big one is bipolar disorder. Okay. Mania is easy to diagnose, but bipolar depression is very hard to, to differentiate from unipolar depression. It's also deceptive because these people come in, they look very depressed, you know, and you put them on an antidepressant, they go out the door and they come back a week and a half, two weeks later and say they're feeling terrific. But then in about two, three weeks later, you get, you know, a little email from them or a call and they're losing their response, okay? That's a common thing you'll see with it. And it's easy to think, oh, well then we'll up the dose. That's the problem, okay? But that should be a red flag to you. Antidepressants in bipolar one, okay? We not only worry about setting off a manic or hypomanic, and that's actually pretty low with SSRIs, but it can occur. But the bigger issue is that actually antidepressants are not very effective, if at all, in bipolar one disorder. They actually, when they look over the course of a year, increase the number of days that patient spends in depression, okay, per year. Now that's not true with bipolar two disorder, but obviously this is not a treatment of choice for a patient with bipolar one. Um, now, the other problem we have in trying to diagnose this and pick up that it's bipolar one disorder is that pa patients with bipolar one disorder have very poor memories for previous manic episodes, okay? 40% of patients with bipolar disorder type one are unable to recall previous true manic episodes due to anatomical damage to the brain involved in self-reflection. Um, and I'm gonna just give you a, 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 the most blaring example I had with a patient. I had a patient who again and again would go off his medicine saying, you know, Dr. Smith, I just don't think I have bipolar disorder. I really don't. And of course he'd go off his medicine He'd get in trouble with the police. He'd get, he'd end up in the hospital, you know, all these things, get in trouble, alienate his family, et cetera. He'd end up back in his antidepressant and be going, I can't believe I went off my medicine, Dr. Smith. I'm never going to do that again. I swear I'm not. Well, this kept up. And um, finally, he went off his medicine and he jumped out of a second floor window. His fall was broken by a bush, big bush, smashed up his face, but he survived it. And we thought, well, at least this will certainly, he'll be able to remember this. He'd just look in the mirror. About two years later, he was saying to me, you know, Dr. Smith, I just don't think I have bipolar disorder. I don't think I've ever had a manic episode. So that is how profound it is. They do not have recollection of it. So if you have any suspicion, and we're gonna go through the red flags that might alert you to that, you wanna engage some family member or loved one that's known them over time and either invite them into a meeting if you're suspicious at all, or they're not responding to antidepressants or have them on a phone consult with the patient in the room with you, okay? So look for these red flags that it might be bipolar one disorder, depression. 
family history of bipolar disorder or psychosis. We used to think it was only bipolar disorder, but actually it's psychosis increases that risk too. The patient sitting in front of you has a tenfold increased risk that they have bipolar disorder. If they have depression sitting there with you, they have a family member with it or with psychosis, okay? Early onset depression between ages 15 to 19, okay? Doesn't have to be, can be unipolar depression, but that should be a red flag. They come on early in life. Severe low energy depression, okay? Bipolar disorder is considered a disorder of energy, even more so than a disturbance of mood, okay? And when you see these patients, they'll describe, I couldn't even get out of bed to open the window. It was hot in my apartment. I just couldn't even get out of bed to do it. It's just profound energy uh, uh, loss usually. So be suspicious with that. History of worsening on antidepressants in the past. That should be a red flag. Depressions being episodic. So depressions with bipolar disorder tend to last about three to six months at a time, typically. They can last longer, up to a year or whatever, but they tend to be episodic. If you have someone who comes in your office, says, I've been depressed every day for the last six years of my life. And I say, have there been any days where you didn't feel it? Not a doctor. Every single day. Okay. Unlikely, you know, unlikely that that is bipolar disorder. Okay. History of postpartum psychosis. Postpartum psychosis is almost always related to bipolar disorder. Not to bipolar, not postpartum depression, but bipolar, excuse me, postpartum psychosis is associated with bipolar disorder. All right, now you wanna rule out alternative or additional complicating diagnoses, psychotic depressions. We almost always wanna bring in an antipsychotic if there is a psychotic depression. Though we are going a lot on old data, most of the data done with psychotic depression was done with the old first generation antipsychotics, your Haldol, Prolix, and those kind of things. But it does appear a similar pattern is noticed with your new atypical or newer atypical antipsychotics that we tend to use more now. Um, Alcohol, I'll just give you with the old ones, those big studies, we've got an antidepressant alone would only lift the um, psychotic depression in about 25% of cases. And an antipsychotic alone would only lift the depression in about 25% of cases. Okay. The combination would lift it in about 75% of cases. So that gives you kind of an idea with it. Though the new atypicals do tend to have more qualities that work with depression. So my guess is that probably some of them are a little better with that, with the depression part. Alcohol and drug abuse, more than three drinks in a week can interfere with the effectiveness of antidepressants. So I've had so many people who come into me and they're saying, you know, they have one drink a day or, or more. And they say, I've never responded to any antidepressant. And we go over this and I say, are you willing to try cutting out the alcohol? Let's see what happens, okay? I give them this data, can keep it under three drinks in a week, one max a day, under, th I mean, three or less. Um, and it's amazing to me how many then go on to respond to an antidepressant, okay? So that's another thing. And when they say they can't, I'm suspicious that they're probably drinking more than one a day. All right. We want to rule out additional complicating diagnosis that may make a full response to an antidepressant just not really possible. Here are the different anxiety disorders and the frequency seen with major depression. Um, and personality disorders, of course, can occur in which case we wanna refer them for dialectic behavioral therapy, or one of the type of treatments of that nature um, that show good results with patients with borderline personality disorder. 
All right, so now we're on to the thing of choosing meds for treating treatment resistant depression while you're waiting to get these patients in with you know, psychiatrists in the community. And I just wanna say thank you for being willing to do this because I know it's often a very, very long wait with your patients given our terrible shortage. So thank you for what you do because um, these patients are hard for me as a psychiatrist when they're treatment resistant and I, my hat's off to you guys. Um, so first we wanna look and make sure that we optimize the antidepressant dose. They've had adequate dose and that length of treatment to get a full response, okay? Then let's look, you got them on an antidepressant, you've had an adequate dose and adequate length of time. Then if you get no response to an adequate trial, none at all, not even a partial response with the first agent, we usually suggest that you switch meds and class if possible. For instance, an SSRI to an SNRI, okay? or an SSRI like Prozac, sertraline, or whatever, to be appropriate, okay? Something like that. And again, that note I want to bring your attention to, that venlafaxine is only an SNRI. It's an SSRI up to 150 milligrams. Above that, it begins hitting norepinephrine and getting a dual action, okay? So above 150 milligrams. So if you're trying to switch classes to venlafaxine, you probably want to push that dose up above 150 milligrams. If the patient is obese or has high inflammatory markers due to other medical condition, that um, you might consider starting with an SNRI before you try an SSRI, by the way. There's some new preliminary data that these individuals do not tend to respond very well to SSRIs and respond better to an SNRI. If now, so now we've talked about what if you get no response? If you get a partial response to the, or you see a patient and they come in and say, well, I've got a partial response. I'm just still st struggling with a lot of depression and you maximize the dose or whatever. You can look at augmenting or combination treatment. And now we'll go into that, but let's first go in a little more about switching antidepressants, okay? There's no magic. If you've got a patient who is on an SSRI and hasn't responded, and they really want to try the one their friend had, or more importantly, what their sister had or whatever, another SSRI, that's okay because switching antidepressants is almost equal to augmenting. There's not a huge difference. Um, so do feel free to do that if that's what the patient really wants to try, particularly if a family member is on another one and they've had a good response because not only does depression run in a family, but a tendency to respond to a particular antidepressant runs in the family. Okay. But just to give you so many ideas with this one minute analysis of four clinical trials up to almost 1,500 patients showed a modest advantage of switching from an SSRI to a non-SSRI, bupropion, mirtazapine, venlafaxine, Cymbalta, okay, versus a second SSRI. So 28% versus 23.5%. So that's, it's an improvement switching class, but it's not huge. And it may mean more that it's, you know, individuals, like we said, that, that we're showing who have high inflammatory markers, maybe that's that group that really benefits, that brings that number up, okay? Um, and by the way, that's not true if a patient was tried on a tricyclic antidepressant, meaning you don't want to try, if they had a good response, I mean, a good trial with an anti uh, tricyclic antidepressant, desipramine, nortriptyline, mipramine, um, then you don't want to try another tricyclic. There's only a 5% chance they're going to respond to a second one if they had a good trial with no response to a first one. And you can kind of figure out why. When you look at tricyclic chemical structures on a chalkboard, they almost look identical. They just have a slightly different you know, side chain. 
Whereas your SSRIs and SNRIs, let's just say SSRIs, when you look at them, you can't even you can't even tell they're the same animal. It's really interesting. All right, so switching antidepressants. So there's advantages to the different ones. Bupropion is great for sexual side effect concerns, ADD concern if the patient also has that, or if they want to quit smoking, great, or cut down on their smoking. 40 oxtine, still very expensive, no generic. I'm looking forward to this one having a generic. It's great for sexual side effects again. Also seems to have pro-cognitive effects, which is a real advantage. But again, $3, triple dollars, expensive. Tricyclic antidepressants can be highly effective for more complicated to use and more side effects. Immunoinhibitors inhibitors will leave that for the psychiatrist. They're not fun for me to even use um, just because patients tend to get, start thinking they're safe to use with cheese and because they don't have any trouble after they eat pizza once and they think the next time will be fine. It, it's, I've had some harrowing experiences with it. Leave it to the psychiatrist. Mirtazapine, um, great for patients with insomnia and, and you know trouble eating or underweight. But don't use this one if the patient also has P PTSD and nightmares because it increases or even causes nightmares. It can aggravate PTSD. Okay. Now, what do you do with those patients if you you hear they've been on an antidepressant and they got kind of an agitated response, but it didn't meet criteria for hypomania and it didn't meet criteria with mania. And you've had their family in, they haven't, or you've talked to their family. No, they've never seen anything like that. You know, but they're just sort of grumpy and irritable. They still slept fine. They, you know, fine in other ways. They function fine, but they're just grumpy and, and just agitated, kind of paced. Okay. What do you do with that? The new data on this is that lorazidone, Latuda, now in generic, or aripiprazole can be very helpful with this, okay? If you use lorazidone, 20 to 60 milligrams a day, starting the low dose, increasing it as needed, add it onto the antidepressant that they're getting this agitated response, and then slowly taper them off the antidepressant because it has data that using it alone can treat those kind of agitated, you know, the ones that don't, meet criteria for hypomania, bipolar two, but they're having this irritable, agitated reaction. They seem to be getting good responses with this. It has some good data, okay? The important thing if you decide to use lorazidone is you must have the patient take it with at least 350 calories of food or it's not absorbed, it just goes through the system, okay? So that's an important thing. You can also try aripiprazole um, and uh, it doesn't have the dietary restriction. So it's, it's easier in that way. Um, however, its data is only as an augmentation device. They do have not found that it alone seems to take care of things. So add that on, you know, maybe they'll come up with data eventually, but right now the tentative data is it's not by itself. So you'd add that on to the antidepressant or maybe having a little bit of response to or might have one and add that on and keep them on both. The dose of the aripiprazole in this case is 2.5 to up to 10 milligrams. I like it in the lower range. The higher range, it can give more agitation, that akathisia. Bupropion. This antidepressant, even though it doesn't work for general anxiety, OCD, panic disorder or do anything for those things, guess what? Agitated depression all by itself. It has some good data that it works for agitated depression. So you can also switch them to bupropion and use that, your Wellbutrin, okay? And it has the lowest risk of a inciting uh, agitation or a mania, excuse me, okay? All right, so now, got a patient, partial response to an antidepressant or whatever, you got some response, but they're going, yeah, I, you know, 
I feel the best on this one, but I still, I've got a fair amount of, of depression. I always want the percent. What percent do we have left? How far are we along? Because we want you fully out of this depression. What would you give? That's always helpful to me. So um, what are the augmentation strategies? So these are the first line treatments that had the most data, most research to, ba to back them. The atypical antipsychotics have the most data, but they also have a heck of a lot of drug company money investing in it. So just so you know. Okay, aripiprazole, 2.5 to 10 uh, to 20 milligrams, they say. I try to keep it lower, guys. I really do. I find the lower doses were quite effective. Um, so 2.5 to 20 milligrams, up to 20 milligrams a day you can use. That's what's been used in the studies. Five studies, best tolerated um, of these atypical antipsychotics, very well to tolerate med, as you probably know. Quetiapin, 100 to 300 milligrams at bedtime. By the way, just so you know, quetiapin is only a sleep medicine up to 150 milligrams, okay? It does nothing for um, mania, does nothing for depression, does nothing for anxiety till you get up there. You have to kind of flood the antihistamine um, receptors first. It then becomes an anti-anxiety and antidepressant from 150 to 300 milligrams a day, all right? Some people, smaller people, will respond to a little lower, so put in there at 100. But anyway, it's good for insomnia too. So that's a nice one where the patient's really having a horrible time with insomnia. Risperidone, one to three milligrams a day. Less diet, a little more side effects, but still pretty impressive data. And I found it to be very helpful, very effective medicine. Lithium carbonate. I don't know how careful, I mean, how comfortable you are with prescribing lithium. Um, I go into that in another talk if you're interested or can answer your questions at the question and answer thing. But um, most of the studies with lithium as an augmentation device were used with tricyclic antidepressants, but the recent studies involving the um, SSRIs, SNRIs, um, it looks really good with them too. It's more complicated to use with so the blood monitoring, but it, it's really well tolerated. Patients do well with this. Um, and it's an underused medication. Um, all the drug companies just trash lith lithium as hard to tolerate, major side effects, all of that to try and sell their, you know, Depakote, their all the atypical antipsychotics. So lithium people became afraid of using it. It's a well-tolerated and a wonderful medicine. Um, and the neat thing it does too is it reduces suicide risk. Even if they have no response to treatment, there's something independent of that. Um, but it's, it's a very good medicine. T3, we prefer T3 over T4. So when, you know, synthroid is T4, when T4 goes into the body, the body has enzymes that cleave off a thyroid molecule, and T3 is the one that passes into the blood-brain barrier. But as you, I'm sure, well know, T3 doesn't last in the system very long. It's destroyed pretty quickly. So T4 is the preferred one for hypothyroidism. But when we're trying to treat depression, the most effective is the T3 because we've got to get that into the brain, okay? We start with 25 micrograms per day for two weeks. They tolerate it well, but no response. Go for another two weeks at 50 micrograms a day. If no response after four weeks on, on this, um, you can you know, taper them, quickly taper them off. And about one out of 4.3 respond. Second line augmentation um, is L-methylfolate, Deplin. It's a, brand, it's a prescription. 15 milligrams a day comes in 7.52, but it did not surpass a placebo. So I would go right to 15 milligrams a day. Really no side effects with it. Obviously you can buy folic acid over the counter, but that has not found to, be, to beat placebo. And the thought behind that is folic acid is turned into L-methylfolate, which is the active ingredient in the body, and that patients who are having a depression that won't respond to antidepressants, 
but will with L-methylfolate added, don't have enough of the enzyme to convert folate to L-methylfolate. Um, and so that's why the folate does not seem to be effective. These are small studies. And again, this is a drug company. I mean, it's a company making med medicine off of this prescription. SAMI augmentation, this is herbal agent, but actually has pretty good data. 800 milligrams twice daily, well tolerated, but limited studies. Benzodiazepines, when lots of secondary anxiety, you can use that. There's some data to support it, it helps. Minocycline, just as a side note, 200 milligrams a day, because I know you prescribe it often for other things. If the patient has a high, high levels of inflammation, an increased CRP, and you're going to treat them for acne, this is something to consider rather than the doxycycline or tetracycline because it might help with the depression too. Okay, augmentation strategies that don't work. Bupropion, it's good as an antidepressant. And I know this is shocking because um, I, I, you know, before I discovered all this, um, I pay added bupropion to many, you know, uh, SSRI and SNRI. It's good as an antidepressant, but it's no better than placebo when added onto a placebo. Now, how does that work? Because if you add it on, sometimes you get a response. What that means, you guys, is you can take them off the SSRI and SNRI. It's not the combination that's doing it. It's the bupropion. And I never used to know before this research came out, you know, do you keep them on both? How long do you keep them on both? The data is unless you've got them on the SSRI for the anxiety for some reason, you can take them, taper them off if they get a good response after adding the bupropion on, just taper them off the SSRI and if they get a good response, okay? Because it's not an augmenter of the SSRI or SNRI. Lamotrigine, no better than placebo in unipolar treatment-resistant depression. Same with buspirone, not effective. Omega-3 fatty acids, 31 studies, no benefit, okay? I think we've studied it enough. Estrogen, although it may improve mild mood symptoms during perimenopausal symptoms, it, uh, or perimenopausal women, it does not lift depression, okay, as an augmenter. It would make a difference as an augmenter. Testosterone, same thing, does not affect, um, is not an augmenter. Caripressine, now this one's really surprising. This is new, new study, 750 patients. So good size, study, double blind, uh, placebo control, cast doubts on its use for treatment resistant depression. And guess what? It has a FDA approval for it based on small studies, short, short interval. You know, you keep keep the patient on for a while, you might see it doesn't last, okay? So these are drug studies, but this new study, 750 patients, and it did not show no benefit over placebo. Good study. So most people are saying, don't bother with it. Zoran alone, I was real hopeful that this might be helpful as an augmenter, you know, as it's a medication for postmenopause, I mean, postpartum depression, and very effective with that, works within a couple of weeks, but does not seem to have any augmentation advantage in the studies so far. Okay, so alternative additional treatments to medication. Um, you know, psychotherapy in the STAR, STAR D study, that's that one that's government funded, huge study. Um, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, was equal to medications for depressions, but not the most severe depressions. If you've got a very severe depression, you need medications, okay? But if it's a mild to moderate, CBT can work equally well in those studies. Marriage and family therapy is important. There was a study done with if a patient with depression is placed on antidepressant is going home to a hostile environment, they only have a 20% chance of responding to an antidepressant. You got to intervene with the rest, if at all possible, if they'll allow you to help, you know, get the non-track 
go to someone or get some therapy or whatever with that problem. Dialectic behavioral therapy for borderline personality. So mindfulness is good for all pe people with depression. Behavioral activation. I always laugh at this one. That's what my, the residents I, I, I teach and supervise. Now they said there's a new therapy, behavioral activation. I went, What's that? Well, it's what we've all done for years and years, but it's now a therapy. It's basically encouraging the patient to get out and do things they used to enjoy, even though they're depressed, and get in, engaged and involved with others. Okay. Exercise. You guys know this. Aerobic ex exercise, 30 minutes each day or 45 minutes three times a week, has been shown to be effective as medication, at equal to medications in mild to moderate depressions. Okay takes five to six weeks to work, great to use for augmenting medication. But this is the thing I do want in, in light exercise work. This is the thing I want you to zone in on, which I have learned from air, air as many times myself, is I have a patient who has a great response. They come in, they've relapsed, start looking at the medicine, any new medicines, any new medical, et cetera. But the key is always ask, did you used to act, did they used to ex exercise and stop exercising? And lo and behold, I found there's a huge group of people. That's exactly what happened and that they need both to maintain their antidepressant effect with their antidepressant. And so I always um, ask, did you stop exercising where you used to exercise? And they go, oh yeah, I did. I just got so busy. Would you like to try, rather than increasing the dose, would you like to try increasing that back in? Yeah, when they see here, yeah, and they put it together, okay? And it's been magical oftentimes, so don't forget that one. Okay, light therapy. You can use that as a augmenter, second tier, or for pregnant women, by the way, as a treatment alone. 23 controlled trial studies show light therapy works, even in summer. There's all these people working in ultraviolet lights and inside that are low light levels. Here's the thing, the intensity must be 10,000 lux, but it must be a large screen of at least 12 to 15, the bigger the better. Because when a light box says it's 12,000 lux, it's measuring a Quarter size, how much light is given off? 18 inches from the box, okay? So quarter size. Well, if it's this big, it's not gonna give off enough light. The person could sit under it for four hours and they won't get a response, okay? If it's this big, then they might not have to sit under it that long, but the bigger, the better. And you won't believe if you go to it, Amazon, you'll see all these Little light box that looks so cute on the person's desk. Five stars. Okay, they look cute. They're easy. You know, they're com they're nice. They're cute. They look good. They don't do a darn thing for their seasonal affective disorder. It's got to be a large light box. White light with a UV filter protect their eyes. Um, usually, a slightly above is better. Kind of a thirty degree angle. Okay. They don't have to look at it. They can glance up a couple times a minute if they want to, but they don't have to. Best time to use is unipolar depression is 5 a.m. to 8 a.m., but if they can't do it, then a little later is okay. Gets too late in the afternoon, it could disturb sleep. 30 to 120 minutes a day. You start with 30, add, 30, add 15 minutes per week until you get a response or agitation. Must use it every day or they lose their response quickly. And, you know, ECT, refer to a psychiatrist. I know you're trying to get them. ECT or ketamine, both very effective. I just, so you can tell patients that there's other hopeful things. You know, hopeful for treatment resistant de depression. ECT is grossly underutilized, bad publicity about it. It is really an effective thing, especially catatonic, psychotic depression, 79% rem uh, percent remission with ECT. ECT slightly more effective with the elderly and ketamine slightly more effective for younger patients. Pros and cons of both, about equal percent of patients drop out of both treatments, by the way. Okay, upcoming, possible upcoming treatments for treatment resistant depression, psilocybin um, investigators use only currently and you do therapy with it. It's very 
you know, intensive. Low dose does not work. They've done enough death data, you know, where they sub, you know, sub symptom or side effect kind of doses does not lift the depression. Repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation. Again, that's a referral out. Um, there's a new one coming out, oral extended release ketamine in stage two trials. That could be a very useful thing. Um, easier for patients to use. Okay, let me summarize. All antidepressant medicines can be effective in treating major depressive disorder, but they fail to achieve uh, remission in approximately one out of three patients. When you first assess patients with apparent treatment resistant depression, first rule out pseudo treatment resistance, rule out medical conditions or meds causing depression first, make sure the diagnosis is correct, rule out bipolar disorder, make sure the patient is taking the med, check on tobacco, alcohol and drug use interference and make sure they had an adequate dose and duration on the med. If a partial response to first antidepressant, consider augmenting. If no response or intolerable side effects, consider switching to a different class of antidepressant. There's no overwhelming data that one option is better than another among the meds that help with depression, you know, as far as switching or augmenting. Don't forget the importance of exercise, light therapy, and contact with caring others. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Smith, for that really complete and, and practical talk for the clinicians. Um, I'm wondering if we have any questions. We do have about five minutes left. You can either um, put them in the Q&A or the chat or raise your hand and I can have you speak to Dr. Smith. Any questions at all? Didn't leave much time. I was really glad to see yet another good reason to exercise for people. I was surprised that it made that much difference in depression, but um, seems like exercise really should, should be more a part of everyone's daily life. And it's amazing when they see that they depre got depressed right after stopping exercise. I think the, the success rate in getting back into exercise is so high. It's really neat. And it's see their depression lift again. It's really lovely. And they didn't have to increase, you know, with their meds with side effects and all that goes with that. Yes, it's such a better alternative. Okay. Anyone else with any comments even? Comments or questions? Patients before? that you're struggling with? Yeah. Um, Randall Silbiger says, thanks for mentioning a significant co-founding confounding factor can be self-medication with OTC products and herbs or illicit drugs. I've seen drug use mimic mania and depression. Yeah. Yeah. I have, I have too many a times. I remember having a patient once who was, had always responded to this one medicine so well. And I put her on it. She came in, she'd been gone for quite a while and hadn't been on the medicine. Came in, we put her on it and she just got as she had all these side effects she never had before. And I'd gotten a complete list, went over, went over the herbal. She didn't want to tell me that she was on something. And finally she went, I am taking one additional herbal I didn't want to tell you about. And it was, we got that off and just whoop, great response came in, side effects went away. And, you know, one of those kind of situations. Yeah. Great, great thing. Great point to bring up and uh, something that should always be asked. Okay. And you've got some nice compliments in the chat. Um, guys, that's kind of you. Okay. And I'm going to go ahead and, and stop recording.